pay his debts. Did you hear me? Yes, I do. The puppets are ready to begin. History is knocking on the door. The year 1517, Martin Luther challenged Rome. The Church of Rome is corrupt. Here begins the Reformation. The English king, Henry, a man of many hearts, breaks with Rome. The Papists have made this earth a living hell. In the year 1600, Giordano Bruno questions the religion of Rome. He preaches dissent, and for this he is burnt. It is not only the papists we must guard against. On the 24th of November, 1632, in the Jewish quarter of this our fair town of Amsterdam, Baroque de Espinosa was born. As he grew, he began to question everything. Everything! Creation and our Creator. God is nature, and nature is God. This truth is proved by reason. How can God be nature? How can nature be supernatural? The supernatural does not exist. There's no life after death. A mind cannot outlive its body. <laughs> How could the poor old prophets know everything within the scope of the human intellect? They had no science. Joshua, or rather, the author who wrote his history. He thought that the sun revolves around the earth, the earth is fixed, and that the, the sun too stood still for a day. <laughs> and the, the quibblers amongst us try to explain all this away with obscure and impenetrable language, but there's no cause for perplexity. Joshua was a soldier, not an astronomer. Even Solomon, Isaiah, and Noah, they are not exempt from human shortcomings. They were ignorant of the true cause of day and night. Rational thought, my dear friends, is a, a self-rewarding virtue. And religious prejudice is a veil which protects the mind from reason. But surely... Surely not all faith is blind. Perhaps. But it is always one-eyed. The revealed truths of religion have only one function. To overpower, to subjugate, and to crush reason. 
and so prevent scientific knowledge from ever being regarded as superior to religious knowledge. Have you said farewell to life? You can rely on us, but you have in recent months become careless and loose-tongued. While my father was alive, I kept silent so as not to offend him, but I can do so no longer. He refuses to curb the excesses of his tongue. He looked at me, smiled in that irksome, superior fashion, and turned our offer down. Did he say anything? Oh, yes. If men's minds could be controlled as easily as their tongues, every king would sit safely on his throne. And then he smiled again. We must get rid of him. He leaves us no alternative. As it is, the Calvinists are busy preaching to the lower orders that our community is full of atheists, free thinkers. Amen. Amen. We must act in the interests of the whole community. So be it. Sir. So be it. Amen. Tell us if they offered me money. Why? What did you say? How much? What did you say? Silence can sometimes be purchased, but mine is not for sale. I told them reason was a diamond without a price. Even in Amsterdam. But master, every diamond can be cut into many pieces and sold in the marketplace. And reason be likewise parceled and distributed. I want to know how much they thought your silence was worth. If I publicly defend the orthodoxy and customs of the synagogue, I will be paid a thousand florins a year. Oh, one thousand florins for keeping my thoughts hidden. And this when you have yet to publish a single word. How much would they give if they knew what was being written every day on this desk? Have you discussed the matter with your old teacher? Rabbi Manasseh ben Yisrael. He still holds you in high regard. And I him. But he's in London on this very day, convincing Oliver Cromwell to let us Jews resettle in England. Assuring him, no doubt, that we are a pious people Believers in Moses and the prophets and the afterlife? No. I don't think my old teacher would want to think of me on this of all days. Now, if you'll excuse me, my dear friends, I need to think. The elders are waiting for me at the synagogue. We will wait and then accompany you. Passions have been roused. No. The streets are not safe for you. No. We will walk by your side. No, please. I wish to go on my own. I insist. You too, Albert. I don't have time to finish your portrait today. It'll have to wait till this trial's over. Ah. Can I 
ask you something. Ask? That portrait, it's you, I know, but why did you paint yourself as a Mediterranean fisherman? Was it one of Master Rembrandt's ideas? <laughs> no, no, no. It was an excess of youth. I saw a depiction once of Massanello, leader of the insurrection in Naples against the Spanish. He was a young fisherman, full of courage and ardor. His rebellion lasted six days. Six days, no more. But days of hope. They revoked the taxes, promised real change, democracy. 1647, I was about 15. You must have been nine or ten. Oh. The news of that revolt spread through Europe like a flame. And Massanello? What happened? Assassinated by agents of the Spanish Viceroy. But he's still worshipped by the peasants to this day. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. That portrait is about as far as I could go. Oh, if you'll excuse me, my dearest Albert, I really would like to build my own. Uncle Rafael replied to them, Hey, Binto, do you know? He said, I will never abandon my faith and convert to yours. Understand? Never. So what happened? They threatened to burn his children. And did they, Father? Of course not. Great Uncle Rafael became a Christian. If he hadn't, you would never have known your Uncle Schmelke or your Aunt Miriam. But he was wrong, Father. He was wrong. Right or wrong didn't enter into the debate, young Binto. It was a matter of life or death, simple. Tell me, what would you have done? I would not have become a Christian. <laughs> Spoken like a true rabbi. Oh, Binto, when you become a scholar and then later on a great rabbi, I would not like to be brought in front of you for questioning. Oh, you are going to be a tough one. In the meantime, my son, you sleep and you thank God we are safe in Amsterdam. Oh. Are you Baruch de Espinosa, a self styled philosopher? I am. You have been heard blaspheming against the scriptures and the prophets. Do you deny this? It is those who ascribe divine attributes to the prophets who were human beings, who say that men make miracles. They are the ones guilty of blasphemy. So you do not deny it. Reason shows us that the scriptures are nothing more than a version of history. They were written because it suited the political needs of those who ruled the world at that time. And as such, they do reflect the common sense of that age. Oh, but we are living in a time now when scientific knowledge has gained such striking advances. We this is getting nowhere. The man is both impertinent and unrepentant. Have you forgotten the crimes of the Inquisition? Will you force me to reject reason as you were forced to reject Judaism? If so, then once again our whole world will be turned on its head. So now he compares us to them. We're not setting you on fire. It is your arrogance that we despise. A free man always acts honestly, not deceptively. In every situation. A free man should not act deceptively, even to save himself from death. If we live just once on this earth, and that for too short a time, 
It is my duty to my innermost self to tell the truth, even if the community to which I belong is deaf. You will light the sacred candles to condemn me to oblivion. But I will not turn to stone. I will not freeze my thoughts. And I will not burn my papers. That's all I have to say. You have 30 days to repent. Why do you resist? De omnibus dubitandum. Doubt everything. Descartes knew, did he not? But he was afraid to go too far. Stopped short before the logic of his own arguments. He did not want to be overpowered by reason. But you? Why? Have the elders made you fearful of death? A free man should think nothing of death. His wisdom is a meditation not of death, but of life. You are avoiding my question, Binter. I know that you reject any conception of the afterlife, but is there a supreme being, a divine creator, yes or no? Not outside the real world. Oh, look about you. The beauty of a wave as it hugs the shore changing patterns in the wet sand. That is God. I am yourself. How can you deceive me so? At least admit the truth to yourself. Let it be a secret between us if that is necessary. We shall bury it in the depths of innermost solitude to be brought out and caressed in the safety of an empty tower. Binto. Only knowledge based on mathematical demonstration and proof is of value. Where is the proof that your God exists? Oh, I know. The sea and stars and moon and sun and trees and mountains and these flatlands which drive us mad. They exist. But is that God? That's a joke, Bint. Or are you bent on deceiving yourself? Where is the proof, Binto? In my book, I prove that even though there is one substance, it has an infinity of attributes. Nobody questions the existence of material substances. But if you assert that there is only one material substance, you deny the existence of the divine. One substance is both material and divine. Do you expect to convince the multitude of this? The multitude? And those of like passions with the multitude, I ask never to read anything I write. Nay, I would rather that they utterly neglect my work than that they should misinterpret it as is their wont. The irrational passions of the multitude do not move me but one little bit. This is the 27th day of July. In the year 1659, is Baruch de Spinoza present amongst us? Is Baruch de Spinoza present here? Shall we begin? The ruling council, being fully aware 
of Baruch de Spinoza's evil opinions and works has endeavored to draw him back from his evil ways. Every remedy has failed. Espinoza continues to practice and teach his horrible heresies. We have ample evidence of his pernicious teachings. The matter has been carefully examined by the ruling scholars and councils. They consent to the banishment forever of Baruch de Spinoza from the nation of Israel. In accordance, they proclaim the following excommunication. בדברי הצדיקים אנחנו אוסרים, כורתים, ארורים ונודים, ברוך בן המיכאל וספינוזה עם כל הכללות הכתובות בתורה הקדושה, וחרי אף, וחשך השם שורף עליו. ואתם, הדדיקים, והשם עליכם, חי עם כולכם היום. We warn that none may contact him orally, nor in writing, nor do him any favor, nor sleep under his roof, nor read any paper he made or wrote. Banished forever, so be it. This compels me to do nothing more than I would otherwise have done. From this day onwards, I will no longer be Baruch de Spinoza. I wish to be known as Benedictus Spinoza, a man without superstition. Words, words. Words are part of my imagination. I form many conceptions in accordance with confused arrangements of words in my memory. Words, just like my imagination, may be the cause of many and great errors. In my ethics, I must always be on guard against playing with words. Have you heard from Albert? There's an ugly rumor that... I know. But there's no confirmation. I have a letter to show you from Hugo Boxel, the great leader of our Republic. This honest and upright citizen poses us with a question. Where is it? From here. I say that I believe there are ghosts. The reasons are these. First, because it adds to the beauty and perfection of the universe that they should exist. Secondly, the Creator has created them because they resemble Him more closely than do corporeal creatures. Thirdly, because just as there is a body without a soul, so there is a soul without a body. I think, therefore, that there are spirits of all kinds, except that there are no female spirits. How do you propose to reply to such nonsense? <clears throat> On the one hand, you do not doubt the spirits of the male sex, but you do doubt whether there are any of the female sex. This seems to me more like a fancy than a doubt. For if this were really your opinion, it would resemble the popular imagination which makes God masculine and not feminine. <laughs> I am surprised that those who have seen naked spirits did not turn their eyes to the genital parts. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps.
perhaps from fear <coughs> or from ignorance of this difference. <coughs> <coughs> divided between Catholic and Protestant. But the house of Protestantism was divided within itself. Oliver Cromwell hey! murdered his king. <laughs> when his ambassadors arrived here, what did we shout at them? Cromwell's bastards! King's murdered! Cromwell's bastards! King's murdered! Under Cromwell's influence, our so-called leader, John de Witt, forced through the act of exclusion, which prevents the House of Orange from taking up their rightful place. The, the throne. Yes, but my friends, the will of God triumphed. The king was invited to return. He ordered Cromwell's body to be disinterred. The rotting head detached from the body and put on a pole. Oh. Let John de Witt and the friends of Cromwell here in Amsterdam beware. John de Witt, John de Witt, who tear them off the big body? John de Witt, John de Witt, who tear them off the big body? How is our good friend John Milton reacting to the restoration? My informant reports that Milton is going crazy with his angels and devils. The restoration has shaken him by the wits. Hmm. He'll never rest easy till he puts his thoughts on paper. Milton will never remain silent. This English example furnishes us with a terrible warning. They sought to depose their monarch under the forms of law. But when he'd been deposed, they were utterly unable to change their forms of government. And after much bloodshed only brought it about that a new monarch, for such Cromwell was, should be hailed under a different name. As if it were merely a matter of names. <laughs> King or Lord Protector. Then this new monarch could only consolidate his power by destroying the royal stock, putting to death the king's friends, real or supposed, and disturbing with war the peace that might have encouraged discontent. And it came to pass that the people reflected that they had achieved and accomplished nothing and they decided to retrace their steps as soon as possible and did not rest until they had achieved a complete restoration of the monarchy. brought here by a messenger. He is waiting for your reply. Should he wait? Well, let me read it first. As I thought. Most honorable, sir. 
Schisms arise not so much from an ardent love of religion as from men's various dispositions, or the love of contradiction, through which they are wont to distort and to condemn all things, even those that have been correctly stated. I have already experienced these things while leading a private and solitary life. Thus, you see that I am not holding back in the hope of some better fortune, but from love of peace, which I believe I can obtain to a certain extent, merely by refraining from public lectures. Yours entirely. Benedictus Spinoza. see you now, standing outside the Vatican, you who once had such pleasing features, so prim now and pompous, suffused with the Holy Spirit and preaching to me. I have written this letter to you with intentions truly Christian, to show the love I bear to you even though you are a heathen. God is willing to snatch your soul from eternal damnation if you will but allow him. Do not doubt the master who is calling you through me for the last time, Spinoza. Through me. There was a time when you understood that God was infinite. Now you perceive him to be the all-seeing, all-knowing creator who determines each and every action in this world. You dream of the devil who deceives and ensnares us against God's will and believing this nonsense as you do, you have the effrontery to bewail me. My philosophy, which you never beheld, you style a chimera. Who has bewitched you into believing that the supreme and eternal is eaten by you and held in your intestines? How do you know that your philosophy is the best among all that has ever been taught in the world or is being taught or ever will be taught? I could ask you the same question. How do you know that the wafer which you chew in the Romish church is anything other than what it is, a wafer? I know what I know. I understand the true philosophy. I know it as you know that three angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. That this is sufficient will be denied by no one whose brain is sound. And it does not go on dreaming of devils and evil spirits inspiring us with false ideas. Think again, you fool. You've been led to become a devotee of this church of yours, not through your love of God, but because of your fear of hell. The single greatest cause of so much superstition in this world. Is this your humility? That you entrust nothing to yourself but leave all responsibilities to others? Your papal tradition is false through and through. Reflect on the history of your church. 
Study with what cunning your Pope has obtained supremacy over the church. Oh, enough of this. Albert Bird is finished for me. of broth for you. Now, please, eat it. You know what Dr. Mayer said the last time he was here. Mania, people have been asking us questions about you. Some say that you're an agent of the French king. Others that you're in the pay of the Catholic Church. A heathen. An atheist. That's what they say. It's Calvinist bigotry. I am none of these. I am, however, no friend of monarchs. The brothers de Witt have done more for this country than the whole House of Orange. I believe that Oliver Cromwell was a visionary, and I do feel for John Milton and his friends to have to live through a restoration. I would rather be dead. Yes, but the next time I am asked what our honoured lodger believes, what should I say, Mynheer? Those things which are conducive to the common good of human society and cause men to live in concord are useful. Society, Mania, what is that? We are all simple creatures with our own needs, aren't we? Those who want us to believe that are not simple creatures, but the people who rule over us. If what you say is true, how can people like me ever be happy? There is only one way for you and for all mankind to achieve happiness. To accept that our destiny is our own. Our misery and our joy are dependent on our own resources. For me, you see, it is reason, not religion, that must form the basis for an intuitive knowledge of God who is not human like you and I, but in nature, everywhere. The restored King of England, Charles II, demands a hearing. Republics fill me with unease. Why should not our cousin of Orange take his rightful place as King of the Dutch? He must, under no conditions, accept the Republic as the legitimate government of Holland. And the Prince of Orange took his uncle's advice. But, my friends, <laughs> another monarch was looking at Holland with greedy eyes. Yes, it was the Sun King, a Catholic. Oh. This Dutch think that they have the answer to everything. Oh. <laughs> the Calvinist fools must be taught a lesson. Oh. France is a great power. Oh. <laughs> And with our friend Charles, now back on the English throne, we must sweep aside this little republic where religion is openly mocked. What does Monsieur de Witt say to that? I stand firm for a republic. Liberty and freedom is more secure in the keeping of many good men than in the hands of one person. The, the, the interests of monarchs and, and people uh, sometimes appear to be the same, but, 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 but they always diverge. <laughs> they both love talking nonsense. <laughs> the House of Orange, with its monarchist ambitions, is fermenting a civil war. 
I will not negotiate on the question of our republican form of government, but I am willing to discuss everything else with the French king. And what do we say To prevent a war, John de Witt offered concessions to the Catholic King of France. Yeah. But our people refused to tolerate such treachery. Yeah. The Papists are threatening our country, and the Grand Pensionary is negotiating with them. I say that John de Witt and his brother have sold their souls to the Church of Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to stand quietly by and watch our heritage squandered? No! no. Our country sold for a mess of Romish pottage? No! Together, we shall go into battle and death to all traitors! Go into hiding. Cornelius and John de Witt were attacked by an angry mob, stoked to fury by Calvinist preachers. They have been torn limb from limb. They're dead. The Republic is dead. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes, my friend. The political atmosphere outside these rooms is vile. There's poison in the air. I fear for you. Oh, this is an unspeakable outrage. This mob have murdered reason. They have no ruler more powerful than superstition. I will go to the scene of this crime and I will post a bill. Bahor. This mob has murdered reason. I've killed two of the finest political minds in Europe. No, no, I can't. No, 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 no. 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 Where will we find a pair such as this? Not go. This is not a time for me to cry. I must understand. Oh, the enormity of this crime will reverberate through time. Holland, without Cornelius and John de Witt, is like is like a universe without God. You're a good woman. Would you be so kind as to bring me a draught of beer? The mass of mankind always remains at about the same pitch of misery. It never assents to any remedy, but always seems best pleased by some novelty which has not yet proved an illusion. Multitude has rediscovered its sanity. And you? I do not wish to leave you alone at this moment. It is precisely at moments like these that I yearn for my oldest and most trusted friend, Solitude. Thus I may not be hated by the ignorant, 
nor compelled to yield to their appetites. I'm calm again. It is far from possible to impose uniformity of speech. The more rulers that strive to curtail freedom of speech, the more obstinately they are resisted. Not indeed by the avaricious, the flatterers, and time servers, and other numb skulls who think that supreme salvation consists in filling their stomachs and gloating over their money bags, but by those whom good education, sound morality, and virtue have rendered more free. My ethics is completed. I was intending to go to my good friend Jan to publish it, but the Calvinist theologians and their dull-witted Cartesian friends are denouncing me everywhere. They are bringing actions against what they call my godless ways before the magistrates. <laughs> They're telling anyone ready to listen that my book is an endeavor to show that there is no God. I have therefore decided to postpone publication indefinitely. generally constituted are most prone to resist the branding as criminal of opinions which they believe to be true. It is for this reason that they are ready to forswear the laws and conspire against authorities, thinking it not shameful but honorable to stir up seditions, stir up seditions. laws which suppress free thought cannot be maintained without great peril to the state. years ago. Even those philosophers who write books despising glory had placed their names on the title page. But it was Cicero who wrote that. Like a golden mist, the west lights up the window. The diligent manuscript awaits, already laden with infinity. Someone is building God in the twilight. A man engenders God. He is a Jew of sad eyes and citron skin. Time carries him 
as the river carries a leaf in the downstream water. No matter. The enchanted one insists and shapes God with delicate geometry. Since his illness, since his birth, he goes on constructing God with the word. The mightiest love was granted him. Love that does not expect to be loved. Thank you.